So this is a, a case that I think is in, in many ways uh, more typical than Dr. Ardalan's case, but uh, still challenging uh, as the patient is just not responding to therapy um, as, as we had hoped. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it, this is a patient who presented in October 2016 at the age of five. Oh. Okay. Here. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, who was previously well with no significant past medical history. She had recently started <coughs> kindergarten and was referred by her primary care provider for weakness and rash. Um, she was less playful than usual, hesitant to ride her bike and had been asking to be carried, but she did not present with profound weakness. Talkative, cheerful, you know, really actually very fun and memorable kid. Um, generalized muscle weakness noted on exam, especially of the proximal muscles. I mean, so far this is very classic, obviously. Cannot raise her, she could raise her leg for only about 10 seconds. Can't raise her head off the table when lying on her back. Um, she could raise her arms over her head, but she can't do the stair step. She does have a Gower's sign, uh, but she can sit down on the floor and then stand up without assistance and without holding anything, um, but can't do a sit up. Full range of motion of all joints, and she's not complaining of any pain, no swelling anywhere. Um, she has a tip, typical rashes as well with patchy erythema of the middle of her forehead and just under her eyes. She didn't really have a classic uh, heliotrope suffusion of the eyelids when she first presented. Uh, lots of changes of her nail fold capillaries, and I'm sorry that I don't have pictures. I don't have the capacity to take pictures with my dermatoscope. Um, so some dilation as well as tertiosity. A uh, levito reticularis scattered on both arms um, and some faint erythema over the extensor surfaces of her PIPs. Whoop. Okay. Okay, so her initial lab workup, uh, all of the muscle enzymes were elevated. SGOT was 93, CPK 925. LDH 546, aldolase 18.4. In our lab, normal is considered uh, less than eight. Von Willebrand uh, antigen was at 333% with normal up to 200%. Um, the rest of her labs are really not very exciting except for a strongly positive ANA. Um, and she is positive for NXP2. Um, typical findings of dermatomyositis on the muscle MRI uh, with widespread symmetric uh, inflammation. So, so far, you know, relatively straightforward. Um, I, and I left off this slide, I realized as I was looking at it yesterday, we did give her three once daily um, solumedrol pulses, followed by once weekly for one month pulses. She was started on methotrexate weekly subcutaneous injection at a dose of 15 milligrams per meter squared per week, and also oral prednisolone at two milligrams per kilogram per day, as well as famotidine, calcium, vitamin D. So she had you know, early and quick improvement in her energy level, although not the rash and nail fold capillary changes were actually getting worse uh, rather than better. She was started at IVIG at a dose of one gram per kilogram two months after her diagnosis. It's nowhere, it's six months post-diagnosis. She had initially been doing well on the IVIG, it was trying to wean her prednisone, especially because from the beginning, and this was a, an ongoing issue with this patient, she was very sensitive to prednisone, especially with moodiness and behavior changes that were really, I mean, to the point where the family was under terrible stress from this. I mean, she at baseline is a very cheerful, happy kid, and she was aggressive, she was not sleeping, she was hitting her siblings, she was getting in trouble in school. It was, the family was very stressed about it. Um, I, so at that point, she had a mild clinical flare with increased fatigue and poor gait with prednisolone at one milligram per kilogram per day. Um, I gave her weekly pulses again for a month. We increased IVIG to every 14 days, um, along with pulse dose methylprednisolone uh, with each dose also. Okay, so at this point, she's again doing well. This is, now we continued that for quite a long time. So she's now 15 months post-diagnosis on that intensive regimen still, doing well clinically. She's active, she's riding her bike, she's doing all the things she wants to do. Her muscle enzymes, she's still not in remission. Muscle enzymes are near normal, but not normal. Her rashes are all completely resolved, but her nail fold capillaries are still markedly abnormal. And the family is, again, getting saying, we can't do this anymore. Like, we can't keep getting these pulses every two weeks. This is not uh, going to work. So we said, okay, we're going to try decreasing from every two weeks to once a month on the pulses. Uh, so 19 months 
post-diagnosis. She's tolerating IVIG once a month with pulse solumedrol, subcutaneous methotrexate once a week. We've gotten the prednisone down to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day. At this point, again, her strength is actually great. She's been doing physical, she's like a great physical therapy patient, and she can actually do way more setups than your average five-year-old by this point. Very cushioned, she hasn't grown for over a year. They're still having some of the mood and behavior difficulties. You know, I would really like to get this patient off of prednisone. So I tried adding mycophenolate, mycophenolate to her regimen. We started at 250 milligrams per day every 12 hours increased to 750 milligrams once a day, divided, uh, sorry, divided twice daily after a month. Um, she, got, she did have an elevation in her hepatic transaminases with SGOT-118 and SGPT-136. So this is where I would not do the same thing again. I think I wasn't thinking enough about whether she was absorbing oral medications, and I thought, you know, I don't think the methotrexate is really helping to keep her in remission. I'm gonna hold that and continue the mycophenolate and see how that goes which was not very well. Um, so she was feeling pretty well at first, but with, again, these ongoing capillary changes, low-grade abnormalities of muscle enzymes, they thought I'd better get another MRI. I got an MRI, it was terrible, much worse than I expected. Ongoing, widespread, significant symmetric muscle inflammation that was actually almost as bad as at the time of diagnosis. Um, I put her back on methotrexate, added tacrolimus, and put her back on pulse dose weekly steroids. We also added hydroxychloroquine, just as some adjunctive treatment to see if that would help with some of the capillary involvement. Um, at this point, she developed unexplained thrombocytopenia. It never dropped below about 100. Um, I had been talking with Dr. Ardalan at this point, who became involved in her care. We started kind of co-managing. I had wanted her to get a second opinion around then. Um, the tacro, we held the tacrolimus. Platelets recovered a little bit, 130s to 140s, but uh, then dropped again. And we, in consultation with Dr. Ardalan, uh, we tried putting her back on the pulse dose solumedrol every week, um, despite the, you know, we really tried working intensively with the family. They got a psychologist. They went into family therapy. Um, she continued on the subcutaneous methotrexate as well as the IVIG, which was decreased to once a month. And she continued on that hydroxychloroquine. She actually got 16 doses of the weekly pulse dose solumedrol. Um, she did have a partial response, but she still never went into remission. And, you know, again, we reached a point where we just couldn't do this anymore. Okay, so the next thing I did was rituximab. So this is 28 months post-discharge, and this is about six months ago. So it's December, January. She got two doses of rituximab, um, continued on the monthly IVIG, daily oral steroid at 0.4 milligrams per kilogram per day, weekly sub-Q methotrexate, and the oral hydroxychloroquine. And now she's doing much, much better as far as her quality of life, as far as the mood and behavior. She's tolerating this regimen really well, but we're now about six months after rituximab, and she's still not in remission. Uh, persistent, marked, nail fold capillary changes, including telangiectasias, which you can even see without the dermatoscope. These are her muscle enzymes. They're not awful. Um, but the SGOT is still up, the LDH is still up, and the von Willebrand factor is still up. Um, I do have another repeat MRI planned coming up soon, but the thrombocytopenia is also persisting and is you know, somewhat unexplained. We, we did get Hemonc involved, they didn't have much to add. I'm thinking it might be due to IVIG, possibly. Um, the thrombocytopenia, mom actually noticed that the Platelets dropped when we changed from Gamunex to Gamma Guard due to the national shortage. I mean, I haven't seen that reported anywhere, but it's not impossible. Um, but the question is, you know, what, what now? I mean, this is a kid who's, she's feeling great. She's doing everything. She's doing gymnastics. I mean, I, I do agree with Dr. Dr. Ardalan and I were talking before this, and I agree that when you examine her very carefully, she does have a little bit of truncal weakness. But she's not a kid who's super sick, so it's hard to know, you know, how aggressive to be. So I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to have all, you know, consult all the national experts in dermatomyositis at the same time. <laughs> so I do have a couple comments first. Number one, um, you talk about our enzymes being elevated, but it's an AST and an LDH, and so you have multiple sources for that. So I would highly advise that you make sure that it is a muscle source mm -hmm. and not her liver or some other source because she could be having some dysfunction there and you haven't you don't know it because mm -hmm. it's not normalized 
Um, so I, I would just make sure you do that to make sure That's there's nothing point. else happening there as well. Also, my experience with rituximab um, is that just one series of dosing isn't how you treat. Usually you initiate there and she's had a very good improvement, so you need to continue it on a six-month basis. Okay. And, and you can see, and I've seen this with multiple patients, they don't quite get totally normal, but as you do another set or maybe even a third set, you can get normalization, especially patients that have had this sort of up and down type of pattern. So I wouldn't walk away from something that's been successful. I would go back with it okay. and try it and do it again. Yeah, that's very helpful. Six months would be right about now, actually. So. Um, so we had a patient similar to this. We talked a little bit yes. about it offline. Um, persistently active disease and thrombocytopenia. And I would second what you said. We had this aha moment when the patient was transitioning from Dr. Wallace, who was retiring to me. And I said, what if it's coming from not the muscle, the elevated AST, ALT, aldolase, and LDH? And we did an ultrasound with Doppler. And he had portal hypertension and splenomegaly. And so the spleen was consuming his platelets. And we ended up doing a biopsy of his liver because of that portal hypertension. And he had this super rare thing that I had to learn all about, but a nodular regenerative hyperplasia. We sent him to Lisa and we've stepped up therapy and he's currently, he's gone through multiple rounds of therapy for active disease for his dermato, but now he's doing well on IVIG and tocilizumab every two weeks. Hmm. So I would That's great. do an ultrasound with yes. Doppler, yeah. Uh, yeah, we talk, yeah, Dr. Shinoi had mentioned this to me. We'll definitely get an ultrasound. And you have no signs of activation of the, uh, the um, microvascular, like fragmentocytes, to, uh, to maybe explain the thrombocytopenia when it's oh. not? No, we actually looked at that I looked for um, with hemoc. I mean, on the peripheral smear anyway, no, there are no, no fragmented cells. I have not, and that is another another thing that I think might be helpful. Has anybody have you seen immune thrombocytopenia in JDM? I, I've seen some people with low set because that's probably immune mediated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the prednisone is paid for, so you get it goes down. Yeah. Yeah, but mm -hmm. the range is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the range of the platelets normally lower than it's below thirty. The only other thing I would suggest is we tried fractionating the LDH and trying to see where it came from in this kiddo, yeah, and it wasn't super helpful, but that's another thing you can okay. try. Yeah. I just had a question for you just about uh, rituximab that you mentioned. Um, do you usually treat every six months, or do you follow B cell levels? Do you look at lymphocyte subsets? and? I treat every six months um, you know, with the plan, and we rarely just do the one treatment and stop. We almost always commit that we're going to be doing at least a couple of sequential therapies. And um, usually we'll just do the one infusion on the subsequent therapies like you're doing with some other disorders. And we've been pretty successful with, you know, getting improved remission with patients if they haven't made it with the first dose over time. And sometimes, like I said, it can take multiple doses, also a round of doses, to get things totally to stay quiet. Um, I had a quick question, actually. Like, so having also kind of um, co-managed this patient, and I also have found her very challenging, one of the things that's really striking um, that we've talked about, Melissa, is like how bad her nail fold capillaries are. Mm -hmm. It's always worried me that even when otherwise she seems to have improvement in the other clinical manifestations of JDM, that that plus her uh, also persistently elevated von Willebrand factor antigens, that mm -hmm. there's still active disease yeah, manifesting absolutely. as vasculopathy. And it, it, in a way, like as I've thought about it today, it makes me... Um, kind of almost feel like reminiscent in a way of like interferonopathy patients who have vasculopathic lesions. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if like folks in the group um, think like a JAK inhibitor might be helpful for this patient who, you know, is manifesting in this way with all this chronicity to her vasculopathy. Good. Hannah Kim says yes. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha, 
There's very little data on that, but um, there happened to be one of the, the Savi patients that was studied on the baricitinib study had been on rituximab and had low B cells. They were on IVIG also, so they at least had some protection, but they tolerated it okay, okay. and had some improvement in their underlying disease. So that, that's, that's for sure that's true, yeah. That it would, that it would be difficult to get, mm -hmm. but. I mean, so uh, there are the, the JAK inhibitors that at least the writer mentioned. Uh, baricitinib and tofacitinib, they're approved for adult RA, so I think there are people that are starting to at least try to get that off-label. Right. I think it probably would be possible to get it if we persisted. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think it's a really good option to have, and I, I really appreciate your uh, experience, Dr. Reed, with giving rituximab multiple, you know, with not, not giving up too soon on the rituximab. That's very helpful perspective.